Okay, so I'm Gerald Dalpan, and I'm the director of the Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. So um, my office deals largely with post-market drug safety, so that would be ICHE 2 b C, D, and E, but today I'm going to talk about ICHE2A. And so no conflicts. So let me give a little bit of background on ICH. So I understand that this whole conference is about ICH training. Um, so maybe you know all this already, but I think it provides good context for the discussion of E2A. ICH is a global harmonization effort comprised of regulators and the research-based pharmaceutical industries across the globe. It was started in 1990, so almost 30 years ago. And its objectives are to improve efficiency of new drug development and registration, and to promote public health, prevent duplication of clinical trials in humans, and minimize the use of animal testing without compromising safety and effectiveness. So it looks for efficiencies. And this is accomplished through the development and implementation of harmonized guidelines and standards. So the ICH Association was officially established on October 23rd, 2015. And you can see at this link the a news release that announced the establishment of the ICH Association. And then the Articles of Association, those are the documents that describe the association, are published on the ICH website at the link that I have provided. The ICH Association is a nonprofit legal entity under Swiss law with the aim to focus global regulatory harmonization work in one venue. So the ICH website has lots of details on ICH structure and governance. So I'm going to spend only a very little bit of time on this. The main body is the ICH assembly that has 44 members and observers. There's a management committee with 15 members and observers, and then the MEDRA Management Committee with nine members and observers. There's a secretariat and coordinators, and then there are multiple working groups in quality, safety, efficacy, and multidisciplinary, and those are all represented at the training here yesterday and today. There are currently 26 working groups staffed by 646 experts from the organizations that make up ICH. This is the ICH process. It goes from step one at the beginning on the left to step five, the end of the process at the top. Step one is consensus building around a technical document. Step two, is the ICH parties agree on the technical document, they come to consensus on the technical document, and the draft guideline is adopted by the regulators. And with that, they move to step three, which is regulatory consultation and discussion. In the United States, that means we post the guideline on our website and we ask for public comment on it. Um, and then we, once, we've once all the parties have received the public comment, they go back for step four to finalize the document, and then you have a final ICH guideline, and step five is the implementation in each of the regions. So it's important to understand the step system of the ICH process. So, this is a brief overview of ICH guidelines. There are over 60 guidelines on technical requirements on 
safety, which is mainly the animal studies and the preclinical studies. There are 14 there. Quality, 23 guidelines. Efficacy, 21 guidelines and six multidisciplinary guidelines. The, or, there is also the electronic standards for the transfer of regulatory information. There's the common technical document, or CTD, and the electronic common technical document, ECTD, and MEDRA, the Medical Dictionary for Regulatory Activities, which is standardized medical terminology. And you can find all these at the link on the slide. So these are the finalized guidelines that you can find on the ICH website. The safety, quality, efficacy, and uh, multidisciplinary. Other ICH products include um, different guidelines on technical standards here for safety, quality, efficacy, and multidisciplinary. So now we're going to talk about ICH E2A. E2A is a relatively old guideline. It was um, the step four version. Remember, that's the step when the regulators and the industry have agreed on the guideline, um, and then it goes for implementation. It's from almost 25 years ago, October 27, 1994. And the guideline is titled Clinical Safety Data Management Definitions and, and Standards for Expedited Reporting, E2A. So this is about definitions and standards of expedited reporting from pharmaceutical companies to regulatory authorities during clinical trials. So what kinds of things will you find in ICH E2A? Well, first of all, let me ask a question. How many of you have read or seen ICH E2A? So some of you. So how many of you are new to ICH E2A? Is it something new? Okay, some of you as well, okay. So ICH E2A sets forth some very basic fundamental principles for adverse event reporting. It defines an adverse event or an adverse experience. It defines an adverse drug reaction. It defines an unexpected adverse drug reaction. It defines a serious adverse event or serious adverse drug reaction. It defines expectedness of an adverse drug reaction, and it defines causality assessment in case reports. And I'll go over each one of these, but I want to emphasize that these are very, very important fundamental concepts for understanding adverse event reporting. You need to know these to understand um, what you have to report, okay? Um, ICH E2A was mainly designed with clinical trials in mind. And then ICH E2D is a different ICH guideline that concentrates on the post-market safety because some considerations in post-market safety are different from those in clinical trial pre-market drug development but the fundamental concepts are still the same. So FDA revised its pre-market safety reporting rule in 2010. We, have published, we published amended or new changed safety reporting regulations for investigational new drugs on September 9th, 2010. The reason for the amended regulation was our view that industry was misapplying the reasonable possibility standard. And I'm going to talk about this some more. FDA was receiving adverse event reports from clinical trials for which there was little reason to believe the drug caused the event. So I will talk about this more um, here. 
So here is FDA's definition of a suspected adverse reaction. A suspected adverse reaction means any adverse event for which there is a reasonable possibility that the drug caused the adverse event. For the purposes of IND safety reporting, reasonable possibility means there is evidence to suggest a causal relationship between the drug and the adverse event. A suspected adverse reaction implies a lesser degree of certainty about causality than adverse reaction, which means any adverse event caused by the drug. And we maintain that this is consistent with ICHE2A. What this means for reporting in the United States is that the sponsor needs to evaluate the available evidence and make a judgment about the likelihood or probability that the drug actually caused the adverse event. So for some events, a single case may be sufficient to meet the definition of suspected adverse reaction. In other cases, one or more occurrences may be necessary to establish a reasonable possibility. And finally, in some cases, aggregate analysis is needed. So now, let me go back to ICHE2A. So here is the definition of an adverse event or adverse experience. It's any untoward medical occurrence in a patient or clinical investigation subject administered a pharmaceutical product and which does not necessarily have to have a causal relationship with this treatment. So this is a very important concept. An adverse event does not have to have a causal relationship with treatment. An adverse event can therefore be any unfavorable and unintended sign, including an abnormal laboratory finding, for example, a symptom, or disease temporally associated with the use of a medicinal product, whether or not considered related to the medicinal product. So again, very important. Adverse event does not have to have a causal relationship with treatment. So now we go to adverse drug reaction. In the pre-approval clinical experience with, new medicinal, with a new medicinal product or its new usages, particularly as the therapeutic doses may not be established, it's an adverse drug reaction is all noxious and unintended responses to a medicinal product related to any dose should be considered an adverse drug reaction. The phrase responses to a medicinal product means that a causal relationship between a medicinal product and an adverse event is at least a reasonable possibility. That is, the relationship cannot be ruled out. So now we have a distinction between an adverse event and an adverse drug reaction. Anything that bad that happens to the patient is an adverse event, but only those things where there's a reasonable possibility that the drug caused it is an adverse drug reaction in the pre-marketing period. A very important distinction. Now, an unexpected adverse drug reaction. That's an adverse reaction, the nature or severity of which is not consistent with the applicable product information, which during clinical trials is usually um, an investigator's brochure for an unapproved investigational medicinal product. Okay, let me repeat, an, ad, an unexpected adverse reaction is an adverse reaction, the nature or severity of which is not consistent with the applicable product information, such as the investigator's brochure. Okay. And so it's important that the, the, the type of adverse event or the severity of the adverse event both have to match with the investigator brochure for it to be expected. If either differs, 
It is then an unexpected adverse drug reaction. Now here's a definition of a serious adverse event or a serious adverse drug reaction. So a serious adverse event or reaction is any untoward medical occurrence that at any dose results in death, is life-threatening, requires inpatient hospitalization or prolongation of hospitalization, results in persistent or significant disability or incapacity, or is a congenital anomaly or birth defect. So this is the ICH definition of serious adverse event or serious adverse drug reaction. It depends on what the outcome is. And this is the same definition basically that we have in our regulations. I'll note here that the term life-threatening in the definition of serious refers to an event in which the patient was actually at risk of death at the time of event. It does not refer to an event which hypothetically may have caused death if it were more severe. So it depends on the specific situation of that particular patient or subject. So there are other considerations in the definition of a serious adverse event. Medical and scientific judgment should be exercised in deciding whether expedited reporting is appropriate in other situations, such as important medical events that may not be immediately life-threatening or result in death or hospitalization, but may jeopardize the patient or may require intervention to prevent one of the other outcomes listed in the definition above. There should, these should also usually be considered serious. And we have this in our regulations. We have something called an important medical event. So it doesn't meet the definition of serious because one of the outcomes, no, because none of the outcomes is present, but had the patient not been treated, one of those outcomes would have occurred. So examples of such events are intensive treatment in an emergency room or at home for allergic bronchospasm, blood discrages or in convulsions that do not result in hospitalization, or development of drug dependency or drug abuse. So this is where medical judgment is important. Now, the definition of expectedness of an adverse drug reaction. The following documents or circumstances will be used to determine whether um, an adverse event or reaction is expected. So for a medicinal product not yet approved for, a mar for marketing in a country, a company's investigator brochure will serve as the source document in that country. Reports which add significant information on specificity or severity of a known, already documented serious adverse drug reaction constitute unexpected events. For example, an event more specific or more severe than that described in the investigator's brochure would be considered unexpected. Specific examples would be acute renal failure as a labeled a adverse drug reaction with a subsequent new report of interstitial nephritis or hepatitis with a report of fulminant hepatitis. So this, these are examples of what I said in the previous slide. If it's more specific or more severe, it becomes unexpected. So here it says acute renal failure, which is a very broad term, but now you receive a report that says interstitial nephritis. That's a much more specific term. Um, so that becomes unexpected. The next one has to do with the severity. Hepatitis is a very broad term. It can be mild, moderate, severe. If, you, if that's all you have, and then you receive a new report that says fulminant or very severe hepatitis, that becomes unexpected because it is more specific 
with regard to severity. So that's a very important concept in ICH um, that the more speci something that's more specific than what's in the investigator brochure is unexpected and something that is known to be more severe than that which is in the investigator brochure is also unexpected. Now, expedited reporting. This is why we want, this is why we have ICHE2A. Um, one of the roles of the regulator in clinical trials is the protection of subjects in clinical trials. That's why we want to have expedited reporting because there might be some reports that may uh, cause us to stop the trial or to modify the protocol. And that's why these have to come in uh, quickly. So an expedited report of a single case. So an ADR that is serious and unexpected requires expedited reporting. So all adverse drug reactions that are both serious and unexpected are subject to expedited reporting. And remember, adverse drug reaction includes the assessment of probable causality. This applies to reports from spontaneous sources and from any type of clinical or epidemiological investigation independent of design or purpose. So once you learn about something, it doesn't matter where you learned it from, you have to report it. It also applies to cases not reported directly to a sponsor or manufacturer. For example, those found in regulatory uh, authority generated adverse drug reaction registries or in publications. The source of a report, investigation, spontaneous, other, should always be specified. So even in drug development, anything you learn about an adverse event has to be put through this process here. For most new molecular entities, the only source will really be the clinical trials because there's no other access to that medicine. However, if you're doing, um, if the drug is already approved and you're conducting a clinical trial, for example, to um, add a new indication, um, there, there may be lots of other sources of information available to you. Now, the causality assessment in ICH E2A, it's required for case reports that come from clinical investigations. A reasonable suspected causal relationship, that's the term that's used. There's no standard international nomenclature for this. So there's no real international standard for this. The expression reasonable causal relationship is meant to convey in general that there are facts or evidence or arguments to suggest a causal relationship. For marketed products, spontaneous reports, there's usually implied causality. And that's the way we treat uh, post-market safety reports. But in the pre-market, in the uh, investigational phase, um, there's no standard nomenclature, uh, but it's generally meant to convey that there are facts or evidence or arguments to suggest a causal relationship. Some other observations. For an expected serious ADR, adverse drug reaction, an increase in the rate of occurrence, which is judged to be clinically important. So if, if you know about an adverse event, but then it's all of a sudden becoming more frequent. And you might find this, for example, when you have a clinical trial in a new indication or a new patient population. That should be um, reported as well. A significant hazard to the patient population, such as lack of efficacy with a medicinal product used in treating a life-threatening disease, if you learn that as well. And a major safety finding from a newly completed animal study, such as carcinogenicity, because some of these animal studies are still ongoing while the human studies are ongoing. 
So you may learn something from an animal study in the middle of your clinical trials. Now, what are the reporting time frames? For a fatal or life-threatening unexpected ADR, it's seven calendar days after the sponsor's first knowledge that a case qualifies for initial notification. And then a complete report an additional eight days later. So this is the tightest time frame, is the seven calendar days for a fatal or life-threatening unexpected ADR. All other serious unexpected ADRs, 15 calendar days after the sponsor's first knowledge that a case qualifies. Now, what qualifies a case? These are the minimum criteria for reporting. An identifiable patient. Now, ideally, that person is anonymous. You don't need to know their name. But the person who is um, reporting should know who that is. A suspect medicinal product. In clinical trials, that's usually the investigational agent. An identifiable reporting source, someone who has knowledge of the adverse event. An event or outcome that can be identified as serious and unexpected. And for clinical investigation cases, a reasonable suspected causal relationship. So the last two bullets make it um, an unexpected ADR. So this is, a, a, again, a very, very important fundamental concept is the minimum criteria for reporting. An identifiable patient, a suspect medicinal product, an identifiable reporting source, an event or outcome that is both serious and unexpected, and for cases that arise from clinical investigation, a reasonable suspected causal relationship. So many clinical trials um, are blinded. They've randomized patients, and neither the investigator, the investigator staff, or the patient knows what the patient's getting. So what do you do there? For serious adverse reactions judged reportable on an expedited basis, it's recommended that the blind be broken only for that specific patient by the sponsor, even if the investigator has not broken the blind. Now, in many cases, the investigator does not have the code, so only the sponsor would have the code. Uh, ICHE2A recommends maintaining the blind for study personnel responsible for analysis and interpretation at the study's conclusion. If mortality or other serious outcome is the primary efficacy endpoint, they recommend reaching agreement with regulators in advance concerning serious adverse events that would be treated as disease-related and not subject to routine expedited reporting. An example might be if you're looking to see if um, a drug improves uh, mortality from cardiovascular disease, and cardiovascular mortality is the endpoint, you would not break the blind for every case because you could never uh, meaningfully complete your clinical trial if you did. But again, this is where companies and regulators need to talk with each other about what the rules will be for that particular clinical trial. So now, um, let me get back to what I started with, FDA's revised pre-market safety reporting rule. We published the amended safety reporting regulations in September 2010, and the reason for the amended regulation was misapplication of the reasonable possibility standard. We were receiving lots and lots of adverse event reports from clinical trials for which there was little reason to believe that the drug caused the event. So we were very busy reading case report forms, or, or, or uh, case reports, rather, that were not informative. And that's because companies were sending in everything that was serious and unexpected without a careful causality assessment. So we 
revised our definition of a suspected adverse reaction. Suspected adverse reaction means any adverse event for which there's a reasonable possibility that the drug caused the adverse event. And that's like ICHE2A. For purposes of IND safety reporting, reasonable possibility means that there's evidence to suggest a causal relationship between the drug and the adverse event. That's like ICHE2A as well. A suspected adverse reaction implies a lesser degree of certainty about causality than adverse reaction, which means any adverse event caused by the drug. So you don't have to have a definitive demonstration of causality, but you have to have at least a reasonable possibility to suspect it and have data or arguments to support that conclusion. So it's consistent with E2A. The sponsor needs to evaluate the available evidence and make a judgment about the likelihood that the drug actually cause the adverse event. In some cases, a single event may be sufficient to meet the definition of suspected adverse reaction. In other cases, you may have a few events. And then finally, some cases, aggregate analysis may be needed. We've published guidance on this. I'm not going to go into FDA's guidance because that goes beyond the scope of ICHE2A and is very specific to US FDA. Uh, but we have a lot of guidance on this, and many of these large trials will also have data safety monitoring boards that may be looking at aggregate data as well. So that's an overview of ICHE2A. E2A is very important because protection of um, subjects in clinical trials is very important, and um, E2A is one mechanism through which that happens. So I'm happy to take your questions. Um, if you, you can ask your questions in English or Korean, I'll, I'll put this on. And I'll just remind you, I travel 10,000 kilometers, <laughs> so I want a question. <laughs> 네, 그럼 질문 받도록 하겠습니다. 말씀 들으셨죠? 굉장히 멀리서 오셨는데 질문이 하나도 안 나온다면 서운할 것 같습니다. 어, 영어로 하셔도 괜찮지만 저희가 지금 동시 통역 서비스가 제공되고 있기 때문에 한국어로 질문을 하셔도 충분히 상관이 없습니다. 통역 측에 마련돼 있는 마이크 사용해서 질문 부탁드리겠습니다. Just tell us who you are and uh, where you're from. Then. 네, 저 한국말로 할게요. 네, <웃음> 괜찮습니다. 네, 저는 종근당에 있는 장수이라고 하는데요. 그 25페이지에 보시면은. 어, 그 시어리어스 A가 발생했을 때 원칙적으로는 어, 스폰서가 코드를 깨라고 말씀을 하고 계신데 ICS 가이드라인에서는 근데 사실상 현실에서는 그 이벤트가 발생을 해서 환자가 이제 연구자한테 가거나 하면은 연구자가 그거를 먼저 깨는 프로세스로 현실에서는 진행이 되고 있거든요. 그리고 프로토콜에서도 사실 그 국내 프로토콜이 아니라 이제 글로벌 다른 프로토콜에서도 보면은 어 연구자가 코드를 깨고 그것을 스폰서에 알리는 형태로 가고 있는데 그렇게 되면 이게 위반인 건지 아니면 지금 프로세스를 고쳐야 되는 건지가 궁금하거든요. Okay, so this is a complicated area. I think one of the most complicated areas um, is the, the, how to deal with managing blinded cases. And I don't work in this area in clinical trials, so I'm, this slide is the one that I'm least comfortable with, actually. Um, but in general, the investigator, as far as I understand it, does not have the code. So the investigator really couldn't be uh, unblinding the case and then would have to talk um, with the company. Um, but one of the principles is as many people as possible should remain blinded even if some people, such as the physicians treating the patient and maybe certain safety people in the company should um, uh, know. I, I think in, in 
complex cases, it's probably best to talk with the regulator about this because um, the guidelines um, might be different. The best approach, I'll say, might be different from one study to the next, as, as we say here. 네, 답변이 되셨길 바랍니다. 어, 뭐든지 처음이 어렵지 두 번째부터는 훨씬 쉬워지는데 두 번째 질문 그러면 어떻게 있으신 분 있을까요? 질문 있으신 분은 통로 마이크 사용해서 질문해 주시면 되겠습니다. So while you're thinking of your questions, let me just say um, ICH does not have a formal electronic standard for transmitting um, ICSRs for clinical trials. So many of you are familiar with ICH E2B. I think you had some talks this morning about ICH E2B. Unfortunately, I wasn't here for that. Um, and that is for post-marketing, but we at US FDA are um, adapting ICH E2B for the pre-market cases, the cases that meet the requirements of ICH E2A. Um, and we've had some pilot programs and that's been very successful. And so we're, we haven't formally implemented it. It's not a requirement yet in the United States, um, but we um, are looking forward to having these cases come in um, electronically. Currently, they go to the electronic common technical document as PDF files. So there's not good ways to search them. There's not good ways to um, aggregate them. There's not good ways to sort them because each one is an individual PDF. Uh, but once they're in an ICH E2B compatible database, it'll be much easier to analyze them. 저쪽에 질문 있으신 것 같은데요. 어, 안녕하세요. 한국 MSD 조창현입니다. 어, 질문은 한국어로 하겠습니다. 일단 발표해 주셔서 감사하고요. 저는 이 ICH 정의 중에 그 ADR에 대한 정의를 어, 말씀해 주셨는데 관련해서 저희 이제 FDA 에서 프리 마케팅 세이프트 리포팅에 대한 변경된 규정을 소개해 주셨는데요. 관련해서 질문을 드리면 아마도 그런 변경으로 인해서 제약회사가 FDA로 보고하는 보고 수사의 보고 건수가 굉장히 많이 줄었을 것이라고 생각하고 굉장히 의미 있는 데이터가 보고되고 있을 거라고 믿고 있습니다. 그랬을 때 보건당 FDA 측면에서 이렇게 제약회사로부터 받은 네, 의미 있는 수사에 대해서 어떻게 평가하고 있고 그 다음에 어떤 조치들이 이루어지고 있고 예, 그런 예, 보건 당국의 측면에서 이런 변경된 규정이 어떠한 베너핏을 주고 있는지 그런 부분들이 궁금합니다. Okay, well thank you for that question because that's a very important question for us. Um, we want to be spending our time on things that are important. And if we have to look through lots and lots of cases that are not informative, we're not using our time well and we're not um, putting our efforts toward the most important things we need to do. One of the reasons to report adverse events during a clinical trial is the protection of the human subjects. So the types of things we can do um, are we can modify the protocol, we can maybe determine, so first the, thi the first thing we do is we look at these adverse events and we say, do do the potential benefits of this drug outweigh this risk here? And if we're not certain of that, we may put the trial on what's called a clinical hold. The company has to stop the trial, and we have to learn more about this adverse event. And um, we may be able to restart the trial with more information as we understand it better. Or we may um, determine that, that it's simply not safe to proceed. Um, now, that's an extreme measure. Other kinds of measures might be um, changing the dose, lowering the dose, lowering the frequency of the medicine, um, adding in more pharmacokinetic analysis to understand dose response with regard to the adverse event, um, adding in additional safety tests to better um, um, study the adverse event. So, 
the most common things, if we do anything, would be a, a modification of the protocol, I think. 저희가 시간적 여유가 있어서 질문을 하나 정도 더 받을 수 있을 것 같은데요. 혹시 질문 추가로 있으신 분 계실까요? 아, 네, 저쪽에 있으신데요. 네, 안녕하세요. 저도 이제 어, 예, 좋은 강연 잘 들었습니다. 감사합니다. 질문은 어, 그 만약에 이제 저희 수사 이 보고를 FDA에서 받았을 때 에 이제 만약에 이제 회사에서 실수로 뭐 지연 보고가 되었을 때 딜레이드 리포트가 되었을 때 어떤 뭐 조치가 FDA에서 있는지 그 예를 들면 뭐 고의로 지연시킨 경우는 당연히 어떤 그런 어떤 뭐 제재 같은 게 있을 것 같은데요. 실수로 어떤 휴먼 에러로 늦었을 때 예를 들어서 그 어떤 특정 이벤트가 어 익스펙티드 가 아닌데 언익스펙티드인데 이제 실수로 이제 어떤 휴먼 에러로 익스펙티드로 표기가 되어서 회사 내부 시스템에서 어떤 수사로 판정되지 않았다가 어 나중에 이제 다시 그뭐 며칠이 지난 후에 알고 보니까 이제 언익스펙티드여서 이제 익스 아니 그 늦게 어떻게 알게 된 날로부터 그 15일 내에 보고가 되지 않은 어떤 싱글 페이션트 케이스에 대해서 이런 지연 보고가 되었을 때 FDA에서는 어떤 뭐 지연에 대한 어떤 그 제재 같은 게 있는지 그런 것이 궁금합니다. 네, 감사합니다. Okay, so let me um, go back to the reporting time frames. And so we expect companies to have procedures in place to handle adverse event reports. We expect them to have processes and procedures so that simple things like human error um, will be minimized and hopefully never occur. Um, and so there are uh, disciplinary actions or regulatory actions we can take. Um, the most common might be though some kind of warning to the company. Um, now, let me make an important point here. The time the reporting time frame starts when the company first has knowledge that a case qualifies for notification. So when it first has knowledge that the, re that the um, outcome is serious and unexpected. So it might be that they learn about something and it is not serious. Then it becomes serious. The, the, the time frame starts when they learn it becomes serious. Um, and so they have to keep monitoring to, uh, um, to, 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 to pay attention to that. Um, but we do have you know, inspection programs. Uh, when a company submits a new drug application, um, inspectors go out and look at the quality of the evidence and the quality of the data. But what's really important is that the companies have processes and procedures in place to make sure that this happens correctly. 네, 감사합니다. 혹시 추가 질문 있으신 분 계실까요? 없으시면 여기서 마치도록 하겠습니다. Thank you very much. 네, 발표해 주신 제랄드 날팡님께 박수 부탁드립니다. 감사합니다.